the Morris Canal stretched across northern New Jersey, from Phillipsburg in the west to Newark and Jersey City in the east. It was built almost 200 years ago and for many years was an important part of New Jersey's transportation system. A canal is a long, man-made stretch of water. Canals have been used for hundreds of years to move people and goods and are still used today. In the old days, Mules walked on a towpath near the canal. The mules pulled the boats in the canal waters. A mule driver steered the mules along the towpath. The captain steered the boat in the canal. On the Morris Canal, mule drivers were often children. You might think of a canal as a water highway. The Morris Canal stretches 102 miles from beginning to end. In the early 1800s, there were no highways or airplanes. A trip across New Jersey was very difficult in those days and very expensive. As a result, basic daily needs like food or coal or lumber was only available from the local area or was very costly. A trip on the Morris Canal would take about five days. A Morris Canal boat could carry 70 tons of cargo with just two mules. A boat going from Phillipsburg to Jersey City on the Morris Canal first would climb up 700 feet in the west towards Lake Apacom, and then go down 900 feet in the east from Lake Apacom to Jersey City. That large change in elevation is still a world's record today for a canal. The Morris Canal is very close by. Let's zoom in and take a look. In 1750, Colonel Ford built two iron forges near waterfalls on the Rockaway River. These forges processed the abundant iron ore nearby and were the beginning of Wharton's long history as an important mining and iron ore production center. Several large mines extracted iron ore from rich deposits in the area. They shipped the ore on the canal and on railroads and also supplied local iron furnaces. These industries contributed to Wharton's early growth. However, competition from factories in the West, including Joseph Wharton's own Bethlehem Steel Company, proved to be too much for New Jersey's iron industry. Wharton's industrial leaders switched to textile manufacturing, especially silk goods. Wharton was originally known as Port Orem, the Orem Wharton and Hans families owned several businesses in the area. The buildings on these streets look much the same today. A history of industry shapes even the scenery in Wharton. Washington Pond started out as a series of small mining pits. These were gradually combined into a single large pit, which was eventually dammed and filled with water to provide power for a nearby mill. This mill was converted to a silk factory in the early 1900s. Wharton's commitment to remembering its heroes has transformed this area into beautiful Memorial Park. Wharton also has held a festival promoting the Morris Canal for more than 35 years. The festival features rides on the canal, unique items for purchase, and lots of good food and entertainment. Let's look at the westernmost section of the canal in Phillipsburg. Once on the New Jersey side of the river, 
a boat would go through the entry arch and climb up the first canal plane. This plane was called Plane 11 West, since it was the 11th plane in the western part of the canal. Today the plane is gone, but you can still see the incline to the river and the archway that marks the beginning of the canal. The Morris Canal mostly carried coal from Pennsylvania to the factories in northern New Jersey and to heat homes and businesses in Newark and Jersey City. The canal also carried produce from the farms in the west to the large cities in the east. The Morris Canal was built in the 1820s. The canal was very popular and traffic increased quickly. It was busiest around the time of the Civil War in the 1860s. However, just a few years later, railroads became very popular, especially for transporting coal. Railroads are faster and more reliable than canals, and they don't have to close in the wintertime. To try to compete, the canal was expanded and wide to handle bigger boats and more traffic. It didn't work, and the canal traffic dropped off very quickly. Finally, by the 1890s, there was almost no commercial traffic on the canal. The few boats on the canal were mostly loaded with tourists or someone out for a weekend boat ride. For many years, skating on the canal was a popular winter activity. Ahead you can see the feeder canal from Lake Apacong. This section was used to feed water from Lake Apacong to the rest of the canal. The Lake Apacong area also marks the highest elevation point of the canal. The canal descends from this point as it heads east towards Jersey City. We'll return to Wharton and take a closer look at the canal. Portions of the canal can still be seen in Wharton today. Let's zoom in and take a closer look at Lock 2 East in Wharton and the remaining portion of the canal leading up to the lock. Most often a canal is built on flat, level ground, like in these pictures. But sometimes the ground is uneven and the canal has to go up and down a hill. A canal uses a special gate called a lock to go up and down a hill. The boat goes into the open gate in the lock and the gate is closed behind it. Then, water is poured into the lock, and the boat rises with the water. The other gate is opened, and the boat continues on its way. These are pictures of some locks on the Morris Canal. Here, the mule leader waits for the boat to go in the lock and rise to the next level. This machinery controls the heavy lock gates. When the gates are open, the water pours in. The water raises the boat in the lock while everyone patiently waits.
Lock 2 East in Wharton was a lovely pastoral scene. It still is today, although the lock tender's house is in ruins. This lock was sometimes called Bird Lock after the family that tended the lock and lived in the house for many years. You can still stand on the lock walls and look into the lock, just like the children in this picture. Wharton was home to several Morris Canal features. Let's take a look at another one called Plain 5 East. The Morris Canal introduced a unique way to go up and down large hills. These were called planes and were basically small water-powered railroads. The canal boat would fit into a special car called a cable car. In this picture, a boat approaches the cable car. The cable car is half buried in the water in the center of the picture. The cable car had wheels and was set on top of rails, and the car was attached to a strong cable. The cable would pull the car and the boat up or down the hill. At the top of the plane, the cable pulls the car and the boat back into the canal. The mules are reattached to the boat, and the journey continues. Large underground water wheels, called turbines, would spin as water taken from the canal rushed through them. This spinning motion was connected to the cables and provided the power needed to pull the cable car and the boats. This is an actual turbine on display at Hopakong State Park. In these diagrams, you can see how water is forced down the penstock and through the turbine, making the turbine spin. The turbine spins with enough power to carry the 70-ton boat up the hill. The cable car is at plane 10 carry more than just canal boats in this picture. Two ladies in their Sunday best enjoy a ride up the hill. Today you can still visit this site at the Morris Canal Park at the edge of Phillipsburg. Notice the stones set on top of each other to support the plane. And the large stones used to hold the rails for the cable car. If you stand in just the right spot, you can imagine two ladies enjoying a Sunday ride. Plane 5, on the east side of Wharton, overcame a 66-foot change in elevation. This picture shows workmen repairing the plane, perhaps after a washout. There is not much left of this plane. The footprint of the plane is clearly visible, and you can find a few stones from the plane pushed to the side, if you look in just the right spot. A canal would use an aqueduct to carry the canal over a stream or valley. This aqueduct, in the east, carried the Morris Canal over the Passaic River. By the early 1900s, the canal was barely used and had become a hazard. In 1924, after 100 years of service, the state of New Jersey decided that the canal was too dangerous and expensive to maintain. So they abandoned the canal. To do this job, they hired the same man who organized the canal expansion in 1850. He directed the men as they drained the water from the canal and filled in the canal path with dirt and rubble. They also tore down the plains and aqueducts and filled in the locks. When the Passaic River aqueduct was blown up in the 1920s, 
the workers felt very sorry for destroying something so beautiful. In the eastern part of the state, there are not many places where you can see remains of the canal. Extensive development and road building has all but eliminated the canal from the landscape. Did you know that parts of the Newark subway system are built right on top of the old canal path? The canal was extended from Newark to Jersey City in 1836. This extension loops south through a gap in the Palisade Ridge formation between Jersey City and Bayonne. The canal ends in Jersey City on the Hudson River not far from Ellis Island. This basin, the easternmost part of the Morris Canal, today forms the north border of Liberty State Park. By 1926, the canal was gone. Only the occasional Morris Canal marker shows where the canal used to be. But there are still pieces left from the canal if you know where to look. This was Lock 1 West, near Lake Muskinekong in Stanhope. Today, you can still see the top of the lock walls if you stand in the same spot to take a picture. This is a picture of Plain 2 East. You can hike up the hill where the plain was and walk on large stones that held the rails for the cradle cars if you visit the Morris Canal Park in Ledgewood. Lock 2 East in Wharton is one of the best preserved sections of the Morris Canal and features a rare portion of the canal prism still filled with water. Although the lock was filled in during the canal abandonment in 1924, and the top few feet of the lock walls were removed, the site retains a high degree of historical integrity. The borough of Wharton purchased the lock site, the canal prism, and other adjacent properties beginning in 1926 directly from the state. In 1976, the borough excavated the existing watered portion of the canal in order to restore the canal prism becoming one of only a handful of sections of the canal prism that reflects its historic appearance. The borough was in the process of restoring Lock 2 East to a working condition. Wharton will create an outdoor museum to promote the history of the canal and its impact on the development of the communities along its banks. The lock walls are being carefully examined and measured. Students from the Alfred E. McKinnon Middle School in Wharton participated in the archaeological investigation of the lock and discovered some important artifacts. As much as possible, original materials will be used in the restoration. These are the capstones for the lock walls unearthed during excavation. When the restoration is completed, Lock 2 East will be the only functioning lock on the Morris Canal in the state of New Jersey. Visitors will be able to see and experience what it was like to ride a canal boat through a Morris Canal lock.